This is Sky News Today, live from Lviv in western Ukraine. It's 3 o'clock here, 1 o'clock in the UK. Our top stories. Signs of hope in Mariupol. Officials say there are survivors of an attack on a theatre where more than 1,000 people were sheltering for safety. Pictures emerge of the families who are in hiding, while the number killed in the assault remains unclear. <clears throat> A fourth Russian general killed, as Western intelligence suggests President Putin's invasion has largely stalled on all fronts. The Kremlin claims it's working hard on peace talks, but President Putin says Western sanctions will only make Russia stronger. Large Russian business structures, which uh, used to be scared of some sanction measures, now they have nothing to fear. And the young lives devastated by war, we report from Kiev as President Zelensky's chief of staff tells Sky News Ukraine refuses to give up its territory. Well, hello and good afternoon. We are live in Lviv in western Ukraine, three weeks into President Putin's invasion of this country. Today, as the besieged city of Mariupol found itself once again the focus of Russia's bombardment, this afternoon there are some signs of hope. An official at the city's mayor's office says there are survivors after Russia attacked a theatre where more than 1,000 people, including children, were sheltering for safety. Well, at the moment, the number of people killed is unknown, but reports suggest the underground bomb shelter did withstand the assault. We'll get more on that in just a moment. First, though, let's take you through all of the rest of the day's developments. Well, the UK Ministry of Defence says the Russian invasion has largely stalled on all fronts and that Russian forces have made minimal progress on land, sea and air in recent days. Russia's foreign ministry says talks are continuing with Ukraine via video link with the sides discussing military, political and humanitarian issues. A fourth Russian general has been killed, according to Ukrainian officials. 47-year-old Major General Oleg Mityaev reportedly died during the storming of Mariupol. And Ukraine's President Zelensky addressed Germany's parliament this morning, telling members that some sanctions came too late to stop the war. Sky's Charlotte Lomas reports. A man ushers a camera to see inside Mariupol Theatre. The old coat check-in, now a place to line up for food. This footage, verified by Sky News, was filmed before the attack. At every turn, you see women and children seeking safety in this besieged city. Outside, satellite images show the theatre days before the bombing. The Russian word for children spelt out on the ground. This is what's left of Maripol Theatre now. Yet another sign of Russian aggression against civilians in this war. The number of casualties is not known, but it's believed hundreds of people were sheltering inside. Russia has denied carrying out the attack, but it is a city Russian troops have encircled. Tens of thousands of people are trapped inside Mariupol and are quickly running out of water, food and medicines. Hospitals in the city are overwhelmed. With no morgue, this doctor was left to leave dead bodies in the basement. I don't know where we will put them, how we will bury them. I have no idea, he says. Local officials have said more than 2,500 people have been killed. But in reality, because of the shelling, the number of dead cannot be counted. But still, this is a city putting up strong resistance. Here, a Russian tank on an otherwise empty street comes under attack. In Ukraine's capital, Kiev, another day brings more devastation. A block of flats hit when a missile was shot down. At least one person has been killed and three others injured. The 35-hour-long curfew on this city has now been lifted, and while the Russian advance seems to have halted, 
is by no means over. For those left in the city, it's an uneasy wait for what happens next. President Zelensky, though, says Ukraine is ready to fight. In his latest video address to the German parliament, he criticizes Western leaders for putting the economy first. We asked you about preventive sanctions. We urged Europe to many countries. We urged you. So such sanctions that the enemy felt that you are a force, but you delayed. We understood that you wanted to support your economy, economy, economy. Talks continue on how to end this war, with Russia saying it's in discussion with Ukraine via video link. But this will do nothing to stop the exodus of people, with thousands leaving Ukraine every day. Any peace deal for this country will involve compromise, one difficult to envisage. Charlotte Lomas, Sky News. Well, let's look at the situation across the country then. And as we've been saying, the Russian ground invasion has stalled. According to analysts, you can see the areas of Russian control on this map. But attacks on cities around the country continue, and nowhere more so than in Mariupol. The theatre attacked yesterday is at the centre of the besieged city, and the Russian troops surrounding the city have repeatedly targeted residential areas. To the west, Odessa is still in Ukrainian hands. Russian naval ships have been firing at targets along the coast. And an MP from the region told Sky News that the city is preparing to defend itself. In the north, in Chernihiv, it's also been pounded by Russian firepower. For weeks now, the regional governor says that 53 people were killed by Russian troops yesterday, 13 of them while queuing for bread. And in the capital this morning, one person was killed and others injured after an intercepted missile hit a residential area. Well, in the last hour, we heard from President Putin, who responded to the escalation of Western sanctions on Russia. He's been chairing a meeting on the economic development of Crimea ahead of the anniversary of its annexation and admitted the international clampdown imposed by other countries has had an impact on his plans for the region but claimed the sanctions will open other doors. Restrictions imposed on Russia, they of course create many problems. But not just problems, they also open new opportunities and and we have, for example, now that large Russian business structures, which uh, used to be scared of some sanction measures, now they have nothing to fear. Well, NATO's Secretary General says the military alliance is determined to stop the war in Ukraine from escalating further. Speaking in Berlin, Jens Stoltenberg welcomed German Chancellor Olaf Scholz's efforts to find a diplomatic solution to the conflict. But he added that Vladimir Putin's war had shattered peace and shocked the world. NATO has a responsibility to prevent this conflict from escalating further. That would be even more dangerous and would cause more suffering, death and destruction. Germany is also stepping up to help protect and defend all the NATO allies. With more troops in Lithuania, fighter jets in Romania and ships on patrol. This is part of NATO's swift, decisive and united response to this fundamentally changed security environment. Well, peace talks between Russia and Ukraine are continuing via video link. There are some signs of progress. So what does each side want? Well, Russia has reportedly demanded that Ukraine renounce its ambition to join NATO. A neutral status for Ukraine would be declared along the lines of Austria or Sweden. Under international law, neutrality prohibits states from interfering in conflicts or territorial disputes. And Russia also wants Kiev to promise not to allow foreign military bases or weapons in Ukraine. Meanwhile, Ukraine's first demand is a ceasefire and the withdrawal of Russian troops. 
An official in President Zelensky's office has said Kiev is insisting on a legally binding document with security guarantees for Ukraine. These could come from specific agreements with Western allies, but it's unlikely Moscow would accept that unless Russia was also named guarantor, and it's unclear how that could work. Well, the same Ukrainian official also said the main subject under discussion was whether Russian troops would remain in separatist regions in eastern Ukraine after the war and where the borders of those regions would be. <coughs> well, Sky's Nick Martin is in Odessa, the Ukrainian port city on the Black Sea. And obviously, uh, a real aim of President Putin is to take over control of the Black Sea. We see the fighting at, at one end in Mariupol and the preparations where you are, Nick, in Odessa. Yeah, that's right. We're we're down right on the on the shore here this afternoon in uh, Odessa. And this morning we saw some video on social media, some stills, which suggested that there was a, a naval military presence out here in the Black Sea. There were quite grainy pictures on the long end of a lens, so by no means, uh, you know, near here. But there was five or six uh, naval Russian ships, what, what we think were that, uh, building up here in the Black Sea. And that would kind of tally with, with what we've been uh, uh, hearing. Of course, this is one of the major seaports in Ukraine. The others are Mariupol and uh, Mykolaiv. These are two cities that have already suffered sustained fighting, sustained damage, and strategically and militarily very important for Vladimir Putin. Here they are trying to prepare for that. The theory being that they, they would expect that the forces would come from the north and from the east and try to encircle this city before any kind of offensive from the sea. We will wait and figure out whether that actually happens. We were in the town earlier. We were watching some children just pay, drawing with chalk on the pavements of the one of the main squares here when the air raid sirens rang out. I have to say that... Well, the Odessans, they're not, they're not particularly perturbed about the air raid sirens. A lot of people just carried on what they were doing, but one family seemed to know better. And we went down into the, to the subway with them and I got chatting with them and they were from Mykolaiv. Uh, their street had been shelled and nine people had died. They'd got the car across to Odessa where they're staying with friends. And so they have some first-hand experience of the dangers from the skies here. And we sat for about 10, 15, 20 minutes down in the subway surrounded by all the old tourist trinket shops that are all closed down now and I got talking to them about how stressful it is for as parents they've got two little children uh, being caught up in this war that nobody here had asked for and so preparations here are still very much ongoing you can't go anywhere in this city without seeing barricades um, sandbags military everywhere there are even some tanks and some other technical vehicles dotted around surround sort of covered with camouflage that a lot of the locals have been spending weeks now making. But the main eyes are out here into the Black Sea because for Odessa, this is one of the big watch points here. We're close to the port, major infrastructure, and we know sl slowly but surely there is a, a naval build-up here in the Black Sea. And it's sort of any time from now we would expect perhaps to hear... Um, so, something happened. This morning we ha heard an explosion that shook the windows of our hotel. I was talking about it on Sky News earlier. We understand that that was a controlled detonation carried out by the Ukrainian military down on the beach. So it just goes to show that it can be a confusing picture sometimes and it takes a while to try to establish what is actually going on. But for a period of time, a lot of people are on edge thinking, you know, is this it? Is this the beginning of the advancement onto Odessa? But if you go out into the town, it can appear very normal. People are getting Getting on with things, but slowly and surely, shops have begun to close, life has started to slow down, the markets are quieter, and there is a sense here that this might be, you know, that many, many hope it isn't, but this might be the calm before the storm. Nick, updating us there from uh, Odessa, thank you. Well, let's get the uh, latest analysis on the situation on the ground in Ukraine. Kamali Melbourne uh, has the latest at the Sky News Centre. Kamali. Thank you very much, Anna and Nick. Well, I'm joined by Air Vice Marshal Sean Bell, who's an advisor at Universal Defence and Security <laughs> Solutions. Uh, Sean, thanks so much for being with us. So this map we've been looking at for the past few days, it doesn't seem to have changed very much. What does that tell us about where we are at the stage in the war? 
Yes, I think we've all been watching this uh, map very closely, looking for movement, expansion of the red areas, seeing that as an assessment of progress by the Russian military. And the fact that it hasn't moved, I think, tells us a clear story, because either they're having a day off, which I think is highly unlikely, or in reality, I think what we're seeing is a massive resupply of fuel, uh, food, armaments, uh, ready for the next phase of their uh, military push. So they'll be moving men and arms into these areas that they already hold, rather than trying to take more territory? That's correct, yes. Uh, and what does this tell us about the fact that the map does seem a bit static, the way that the Ukrainians are able to defend the territory at the moment? Well, the Ukrainians are doing a, clearly an outstanding job, not just the military, but also the, um, the civilian population. They've been very determined, very brave, very courageous, and I think against a much bigger enemy by dragging them into the ur urban battle. And I think particularly of late, we're also seeing some really effective counterattacks, which, whilst tactically may not be that effective, um, as an aggressor, you, you hope that you have the initiative all the time and momentum. What the Ukrainians are doing very effectively is showing that they've still got some fight in them and they are causing the Russians to, to think again and, and second-guess what's going on. Now, while the Russians may be bolstering the areas in the, the north and the east that they hold, in the south it's a bit of a different story. We know uh, that the southern city of Kherson has been taken by the Russians and there is more movement to try and uh, take some of the other southern cities, namely Odessa and Mariupol. Let's take a, a closer look at the south now and tell us how the fight for this part of Ukraine is going currently, Sean? I think part of it, we've got to speculate what Putin's strategic objectives are, given his relative lack of progress. And I think we're seeing Kyiv to the north. And in the south, because obviously it's the centre of uh, the political power. But in the south, if you look back 200 years, Russia used to own the whole of this coastal region onto the Black Sea. And I think if you believe the, um, the principle that Putin is looking to reclaim some of that land, I think we're seeing initially a link between the Crimea and Mother Russia. So therefore taking that uh, link, the land link, and of course Mariupol, Provide, provides a, a major blocker to that, and that's why it's so important. Yeah, and that's where we saw that uh, airstrike yesterday on that theatre. That's right, and I think we're, they're putting more and more pressure onto the defending forces. I think what we haven't seen yet, but just popped up in your news feed before, is Odessa clearly um, is another part of that strategy. The trouble is it's a long way away yep. from other Russia, so resupply. So how would you put pressure on Odessa? You might use naval forces to do that because you don't have such long lines of communication. Yeah, we'll see where they move to next. OK, Sean, for now. Thank you very much. Yes, thanks to both of you. Well, the Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace, is in Warsaw for talks with his Polish counterpart. Their discussions are focusing on the war in Ukraine, of course, and also the security of NATO's eastern flank. And he has just announced new military support. It's very right that Britain stands by Poland, as Poland carries much of the burden of the consequence of this war and stands tall and brave to stand up to the threats from Russia. That's why today I can announce we are going to deploy the Sky Sabre medium-range anti-air missile system to Poland uh, with about 100 personnel to make sure that we stand alongside Poland in protecting her airspace from any further aggression by Russia. OK. Well, let's get the very latest from Warsaw now and go to Sky's Lisa Holland. Um, and Lisa, a little bit like we heard from Joe Biden last night, um, in the absence of a no-fly zone, it does appear that Western allies are trying to provide um, anti-air systems for Ukraine. Hi, Anna. Yes, I mean, I think it's absolutely the kind of uh, bolstering up in the event of the worst case scenario. Um, obviously, what's going on uh, on the ground in Ukraine, the concern is that somehow it might spill over the border. And we saw that attack, didn't we, on a Ukrainian military base just 15 miles from the Polish border, killing 35 people a few days ago. So to that end, the UK's Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace, who was in NATO yesterday talking to his counterparts there, uh, has arrived in the Polish Polish capital Warsaw this morning uh, to speak to the Polish defense minister and we have this announcement of this sky sabre uh, anti-aircraft defense system the British system which is going to be deployed now to the Polish border and it's all all about shoring up that Polish border uh, running alongside the Russian border the deployment as well of about 100 personnel and the aim of that system an anti-aircraft system to uh, somehow it's got the capability to launch uh, 
its missiles three times further than its predecessor, so it would uh, take out potentially smart bombs and also fighter jets. Uh, so Ben Wallace there talking about the unity amongst NATO, and that's just as important as well, not just the military but also the words, uh, sending a message of unity amongst NATO defence ministers and NATO leaders, uh, just in case there were any thoughts there in the back of Vladimir Putin's mind to try to spread and escalate this conflict. Sure. Lisa, live there in Warsaw. Well, let's just bring you some breaking news concerning P and O. It would be sad news for people. Let's find out more. Our business presenter, Ian King, is in the city. Right, bring us up to date then, Ian. Well, Anna, as we've been reporting all morning, there have been uh, suspensions of uh, ferries by p &O ferries all morning. They've suspended all crossings pending a company announcement. We now have had that announcement and the company is going to be making 800 employees redundant with immediate effect. I'll read you the statement. It says uh, p and ferries plays a critical role in keeping trade flowing, supply chains moving and connecting families and friends across the North and Irish Sea and the English Channel. We've been at the heart of this service for years and we are committed to serving these vital routes. However, in its current state, p and Ferries is not a viable business. We have made a £100 million loss year on year, which has been covered by our parent, DP World. This is not sustainable. Our survival is dependent on making swift and significant changes now. Without these changes, there is no future for p and Ferries. And the company goes on to say, these circumstances have resulted in a very difficult but necessary decision, which was only taken after seriously considering all the available options. Options. As part of the process we are starting today, we are providing 800 seafarers with immediate severance notices and will be compensating them for this lack of advance notice with enhanced compensation packages. In making this tough decision, we are securing the future viability of our business, which employs an additional 2,200 people and supports billions in trade in and out of the UK, and we are ensuring that we can continue serving our customers in a way that they've demanded from us for many years. So, uh, essentially, this is uh, nearly one in three employees being made redundant by P&O ferries with immediate effects. This is the third year running that the company has made a loss. It was bought by Dubai-based DP World in 2019 for £322 million. It's made losses over 2019 and into 2020, mainly due to the pandemic, of course. 2021, we've, we've learned there today, they made another £100 million loss. The company's stressing it has never taken a dividend from the business, but nonetheless, will, this will come as a considerable shock, I imagine, to employees. The RMT union is already talking about potentially uh, staging sit-ins on board some of the uh, ferries that have been uh, sat aside and uh, won't be uh, sailing today. So uh, more on that throughout the afternoon here. But that's the immediate headline, 800 redundancies going at p and ferries with immediate effect. Ian, and a shock for passengers, no doubt, too. Feels like a rite of passage, doesn't it, taking your children on a, a ferry like that? Well, plenty more still to come here from Lviv in Ukraine, including uh, we will go live to Kharkiv to talk to a resident living inside the besieged city. I'm Inzamam Rashid and I'm Sky's North of England correspondent, telling stories from this culturally rich region I call home. It's going to become very similar to other places and lose its unique qualities. It's steeped in history. If the Taliban found your family, what would happen? I think they're just going to straight away execute them. There are issues of racism in all levels of cricket. I was on the balcony a couple of times. I was nearly gone. Football is a joy to watch, and uh, when people are disappointed, you can feel the hate. 
I just felt physically sick, so I was like, that, that's really in my system. We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. Even before the pandemic, GPs were pleading for help. Government expects more face-to-face -face contact with patients in return. Men, they want to force you doing something which you don't want to do. Just because you're homeless, and you're looking for a warm place to sleep. We give a voice to communities often unheard and unserved from a region with a distinct history and global impact. Well, Ukraine's second city, Kharkiv, has seen some of the heaviest bombardment by the Russians, with reports of hundreds of civilians killed there over the last three weeks. Well, joining me now from Kharkiv is one of the city's residents, Roma Sheko. And very good to talk to you, Roma. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. And from what we've heard, I have to say parts of Kharkiv sound absolutely hellish at the moment. So bring us up to date. What's the last 24 hours been like? And are you safe now where you are? Yes, thank you for, uh, for contacting me and letting me uh, express the, the situation and feeling about the situation that now is Kharkiv city. Yeah, the, the Kharkiv is shelled and bombed starting the first day of this war. And the Russian rains in Kharkiv, which is shelled and, bob and bombed mostly. Uh, and uh, now me and my family, we escaped from one of such rain. It is still shelled during all these three weeks. This rain, it's called Saltavka, uh, where they're, they're, they're almost third part of the citizens of Kharkiv live. It is shelled during all these three weeks. Many houses are ruined, many houses damaged, and many people are injured or even killed. According to official information from the uh, city authority, during the last day 49 times city was shelled by rockets and bombs now me and my family we escaped from that rayon and we are hiding in another one suburb rayon of the city my son is 12 years old and he is still with us because of the big family i cannot move from the city in by one car but we are trying to survive these circumstances somehow as almost every family in the city. Roma, help us understand what it is like to live under the sound of that shelling. It's been coming closer, I know, to many people. Um, you know, bodies have been lying in the streets. Help us understand the, the fear and, and the trepidation you must all be feeling. It's horrible. I'm, I'm honest, it's horrible, because even it is not shelled uh, where you live, but you hear every hour the sounds of bombing, the sounds of shelling and rockets blowing on the streets, in the houses. And you ec expect every time that it could come to your house, to your family. So it's not, if it is not even the, 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 the danger of the killing, but it's very emotional situation, very stressful situation, uh, even for the adults, but especially for children who is under these circumstances in the city. It's awful. And do you have to take to bunkers, to bomb shelters? And if so, how many nights have you spent down there? And what are the conditions like? Well, people try to hide in a kind of shelters, bomb shelters, but there are no many uh, specific prepared bomb shelters in the city. Most people hide in the metro stations, which could be, uh, could be considered as a bomb shelter, uh, and people can survive there. But circumstances there is not very well. Uh, city authorities try to, and the volunteers try to help people to survive there, to and they provide water and food and some uh, blankets and other stuff that can help people. But anyway, it is when you spend there not one or two days, but weeks, and in some stations, there are more than six or even 700 people gathered in one place. You can imagine what the circumstances there 
what is the situation of people there. It's awful. And other people who cannot hide in metro station, they hide in a basement of the uh, many flats, uh, houses. But you know, it's, it's, it is dangerous too, but it's, it is not prepared for special shelters there. Some people, uh, they hide in a school basement, but again, it is not special prepared for such, uh, for such circumstances, for just such purposes. In a private sector, for example, uh, there are no bomb shelters. People try to hide in a, uh, some underground place where they keep the uh, food, for example, like potatoes and some conservation, etc. But again, it is not special prepared for such for such purposes. So people can can try to hide anywhere where it is somehow possible to save their lives. At Roma. Yeah, Kharkiv is very close, isn't it, to the, to the border with Russia. People describe it as Russian-speaking or ethnically Russian. So are you, you know, how do you feel about the fact that it's Russians that are, that are shelling this city? Well, many people in Kharkiv, and I do believe that many people in country, they didn't believe that this horror could happen. Even my friends who admire Russia and the president of Russia and who uh, believe that that country is kind to us. And they, you know, in these days, they, they absolutely change their mind. And they do believe that now Russia help us to, to become a nationalists. Just because before that, many people believe that Russia's, uh, they are... Uh, kind of brother to our country. But now they've done everything to change this attitude on an opposite way. I know you said you can't all fit in one car to leave, but you know, if you could, if you could find a way out, um, would you go right now? And, and in some senses, do you just wish you'd got out faster? Yeah, we will try to do this. And it wasn't possible? Too dangerous? No, it's not, you know, it's not dangerous because, um, well, every time there is some dangerous and risky situation. But uh, fortunately, still, uh, there are two main roads from Kharkiv that could be used to escape from the city uh, to the center uh, of the country and further to the western Ukraine. It is still possible because Kharkiv is not circled uh, by the uh, Russian Russian army. Thanks to Ukrainian army, it is still uh, the situation where it is possible for people to come out of the city. Well, we wish you uh, very, very best of luck and all your family, uh, Roma. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. And, um, you know, fingers crossed um, that you get out safely. Thank you, Roma Sheker there, who is a... Uh, a Kharkiv, as you heard, resident who is with his wife, her parents, his parents and his 12-year-old son. Um, they can't all get in one vehicle and that's part of his problem about, uh, about leaving. Well, still to come uh, from Lviv here in uh, western Ukraine, could the ongoing talks bring about an end to the war? I'll be speaking to a former Ukrainian diplomat from Kiev.
Well, President Putin says Russia is doing all it can to make progress in talks to end the war in Ukraine, but he has reportedly made a series of 15 demands. Many of them are things Ukraine considers red lines, which the country will not agree to. Well, let's talk more about this uh, hope for diplomacy. Joining me now from Kiev is the former Deputy Foreign Minister of Ukraine, uh, Danilo Lubakivsky. Good to have you on. Certainly this time yesterday, uh, Ukraine suggested that Russia was now being more realistic in its demands. There was talk of Kiev becoming a neutral country. Uh, now Putin has talked about scum and the need for purification. And Joe Biden has called President Putin a war criminal. Um, this is hardly the greatest backdrop for peace talks, is it? Uh, dear Anna, thank you very much for having me on the Sky News today. And But before answering your question, let me express my compassion uh, and full solidarity with Roman from Kharkiv and from for, with many Ukrainian families all around Ukraine who suffer from this cynical, unprovoked war waged against our nation by Putin, which is unforgivable, and this is inimaginable. Uh, those sufferings, we feel it all across Ukraine in Kharkiv, in, in Mariupol, and here in Kyiv. Kyiv still continues to suffer from the shellings, from the explosions, from the attacks of Russia's uh, military forces trying to, to continue to attack and to siege Ukraine. And, but they are met with, very with the strength and strong spirit of the Ukrainian armed forces. So Russia continues to lie. They simply lie. They simply try to deceive. And uh, here, let me say that being a diplomat, I definitely, it goes without even saying that I stand strongly for any, any possible option to ensure peace negotiations. For that, I support President Zelensky and his efforts and the efforts of the big Ukraine team, international Ukraine team, aimed at ensuring the peace process and ensuring uh, defending Ukraine and deterring Russia's invasion. However, I am far from being optimistic that bilateral talks with Russia may bring any kind of necessary and tangible results. And the reasons, reason is very simple. Russia simple, simply breaks its word. And Russia, you know, Russia never, give, ne never uh, never stick, uh, never sticks to the commitments it uh, had uh, uh, done, in, uh, you know, before. So Russia has simply violated all bilateral and multilateral commitments uh, of, uh, in in its relations with Ukraine. So no trust. Well, even before an agreement, there's scepticism, isn't there? Military action can certainly feel like it's stalled when actually what's happening is resupply. You know, is the fear amongst some Ukrainians that, in, in a sense, Russia is playing with these peace talks in order to get that resupply effort underway? Uh, definitely that we have to explore possible, uh, possible options and tools to ensure the ceasefire and to ensure the necessary security conditions for Ukraine. So for that, I believe that it is important to continue the, 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 the bilateral discussion, but also the multilateral pressure upon, upon Russia in order to ensure that at this particular moment the level of security for Ukraine and, and for, the, for, for, for the Ukrainians. Uh, in my opinion, there is a way out, how to move ahead. And for that, we have to explore three major options, three priorities. The point number one, yesterday, the International Court of Justice, the United Nations International Court of Justice, has ordered in its rulings uh, that uh, Russia shall immediately suspend military operations in the territory of Ukraine. It goes without saying that Russia will violate even this binding ruling. But nevertheless, it is important for all of us to stick to the international law and to bring Putin and his regime to justice. Point number two, we have to move ahead with the multilateral talks. So here I recommend the Ukrainian government and I, and I call upon our international partners to make everything possible to ensure that there is a multilateral negotiation team which can go ahead with the agenda of, of, in uh, our common uh, and strong pressure against the, the, the aggressor. And, and finally, uh, that we, the West must not be distracted by the uh, so-called peaceful solutions of President Putin. I repeat this again. They try to deceive us. So uh, there is a clear 
uh, roadmap how to move ahead to provide Ukraine with necessary defensive weapons, air defense, anti-rocket uh, instruments uh, for, to ensure that there is a strong humanitarian assistance to Ukraine and financial assistance and sanctions against Putin. This is what is needed today. What role do you think China can play in this, um, you know, in terms of a, a, a multinational effort to bang heads together? The U.S. and the Chinese are meeting, we understand. There seems to have been a meeting here in Lviv, in fact, uh, with the Chinese um, ambassador coming here. Um, so do you think they could be the one to make President Putin think again? Or will that not happen? I mean, what, what do you think about his behavior, Mr. Putin's behavior? It's becoming more clear that even China understands uh, what kind of threat and challenge is uh, Mr. Putin's aggression against Ukraine? So he undermines not only Ukraine's security and the li and he kills not only Ukrainian lives, but he is aimed and target and, and and he targets the international system. So he is a danger for China itself. And for, for, from those messages and signals, what we hear from uh, different sources, we understand that. And I hope that this is true, that China understands and comprehends how serious is, serious is the threat which is coming from, from Moscow. We can rely and we can call upon China to, to exercise all their pressure, all their necessary pressure on Russia to stop the aggression. However, uh, much more should be done. And here, let me say that the role of the permanent members of the P5, of the United Nations Security, Security uh, Council, is of paramount importance. And we, uh, I believe that Ukrainian diplomacy uh, explores this, uh, this, this track of talks with, with, uh, uh, with China, uh, for, um, encouraging them to continue um, the policy which would uh, uh, prove that China is a reliable partner of Ukraine, an influential partner in the international politics. Well, Danilo uh, Lubakivsky, great to have your expertise on there. Former Deputy Foreign Minister, former Dipl Diplomatic Advisor to the Ukrainian Prime Minister and also Director of the Kiev Security Forum. And uh, no doubt you're watching, as we all are, to see how those talks progress. Thank you very much indeed. Well, as we just heard, there are a number of red lines in those negotiations. President Zelensky's chief of staff has told Sky News that Ukraine is not willing to give up any territory as part of peace talks. But as plumes of smoke from the fighting edge closer to the capital, it is clear that some of the very youngest and most helpless are being left to suffer the dire consequences of this war. Well, our special correspondent Alex Crawford is in Kiev and has sent this report. The capital's skyline is very different now. Kyiv's 18th century St Andrew's Church, but with a backdrop of battle which is getting closer. The city's been put under strict curfew to try to limit the lives lost, but there's no protecting against attacks like these. A second missile strikes less than a minute later. The Ukrainian demands for a no-fly zone grow more ardent with every strike. And despite hints of progress on peace talks, the president's chief of staff told us there were red lines they would not cross. Would you be prepared to give up Donbas? Look, I say an answer to your questions. We don't discussed our freedom, our independence, our territorial integrity, our sovereignty. All another issue, we can see things and discuss. And my president, my president ready to sit in any days, in any place. But you're not prepared to give up any territory? Yes. No territory? Yes. They're on the lookout for Russian saboteurs. We filmed the detention of these two suspects before the capital's curfew. The Ukrainians are worried that Russian agents have infiltrated the main city and are acting as guides for possible airstrikes, leaving tags or markers on potential targets, or just acting as informants on troop and military movements. 
These concerns have heightened over the past 24 hours as the Russian soldiers inch closer to Kyiv and the center of Ukrainian power. Amongst those at risk of being trapped in the capital are scores of surrogate babies. There are so many, the nursery is a constant hubbub of crying demands for attention. The babies are being cared for in a basement, which has been turned into an underground shelter by a very small team of babysitters. These women have left their families to look after these little ones, after the baby's actual parents couldn't reach them because of all the fighting. You have to understand this is war, this babysitter says. Not everyone is able to come. The airports are all closed, so their parents just can't pick them up. We love all the babies, another says. As she explains, they become part of our hearts, our family. And when the parents do take them away, we cry, she tells us. But with heavy fighting around the capital, it's meant the women looking after the babies here are also all that stands between them and the bombings. There are so many acts of defiance being played out on these streets. One soldier and his flute and the national anthem, we won't be ruled by others, it goes. In so many ways, he speaks for his country. Alex Crawford, Sky News, Kiev. Mm -hmm. Well, next, orphaned and displaced, we speak to a man trying to help children to safety here in Ukraine. at all, a lot of them extremely thin. I'm Alex Crawford and I'm Sky's special correspondent based in Istanbul. The people here are praying quietly to themselves. They're becoming very sensitive about having the media around. We aim to be the best and the most trusted place in the news. That has happened within minutes and now it's coming from both sides moving this way. There's a lot of action going on. A lot of Every time they touch them, they spray, spray, spray. Made for people who want clarity in an uncertain world. This is what makes the job so fantastic.
Well, caught up in the midst of the war here in Ukraine are thousands of displaced children, some of them orphans. Let's speak now then to Jeremy Locke, Chief of Operations at Aerial Recovery Group, which is helping to provide safeguarding to Ukrainian orphans fleeing the war. Welcome to you, Jeremy. And certainly amidst the horror of this war, we desperately need some good news, don't we? So tell us about some of the the children that you've managed to get out of those areas of conflict into you know, places where I am in Western Ukraine, which de definitely feel a bit safer. Yes, uh, thank you for having me. And, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be on here and, and explain what we are doing, because we are moving these, these children and these orphans that are in these war-torn areas, Kiev and Nikolov, these, these areas that children do not belong in. And we're safeguarding and escorting them to the, the relative safety of the West. And we're doing this in partnership with Ukraine's government. What are the specific things you need to think about when moving children? Uh, because there were some premature babies that were taken out of, of Kiev. It's, it, you know, for them, it turned out to be a 20-hour journey. And they had to pack the tiny babies with hot water bottles um, as if they were still in incubators. Now, you wouldn't have that with, with all of your children. But what are the specific needs of children on the move? Well, you just you have to imagine these these children are sometimes there are hundreds of them that we move. We've been able to uh, rescue 403 to date, and we do have to take all this in consideration. We were uh, escorting one that was HIV positive with many with diabetes. These all these medical concerns that do have to be pre coordinated so we can care for them uh, when we when we move them. It is a very long journey. These children have been underground for up to a week sometimes, listening to shelling, fighting, experiencing things that children should not have to experience. So we do our best to be able to care for them as best as possible with the resources that we have. And we bring them, like I said, from those dangerous areas to the relative safety of the West. Is it that much harder if they are orphans? They don't have, you know, a parental hug to get them through it? Yes, it is. It does. Um, it, it brings different challenges. You have to understand that Ukraine has a very large population of orphans, over 200,000. There is a, natural, a national registry of these orphans, and it's important that we work through Ukraine's government to ensure that they're not going across international borders without some sort of accountability. So that's why we do get them out of the dangerous areas immediately, and we bring them to the West and ensure that there is that accountability before they do move, because they don't have they don't have parents that are after looking after them. They do have wonderful caretakers that are there, but sometimes there might be one caretaker for, for 50 children. So it's a very difficult, and tedious process to ensure that we are escorting them properly and, and safely and also ensuring that we do minimize the chances of human trafficking. It is getting harder, isn't it, to find even temporary shelter, such as the, the scale of this. So how are you finding accommodation for them, even if it is just for, for days, weeks, or perhaps a couple of months? Yeah, that is the difficult part. But what we do have, fortunately, is we are working in partnership, Ukraine's government, with their a Ministry of Defense. We have a memorandum of understanding, which gives us the ability to I don't want to say commandeer, but use facilities such as schools that aren't currently being in use and, and other sorts of facilities that we can then identify and we can build up the infrastructure within those facilities that allow us to temporarily care for these children a little bit longer. And then once we do have that accountability, we push them across um, one of the borders under the supervision of Ukraine's government to ensure that they are handed off properly and safely to other places and, and just get them out of this terrible situation. Well, we wish you um, the very best of luck with your work. It's, it's a massive task, as we know. Jeremy Locke, Chief of Operations at Aerial Recovery Group, which is working alongside the Ukrainian government. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Now, amidst the devastation of this war, Volodymyr Zelensky has become something of a global icon. Now, the Ukrainian president has been immortalised in Lego form, with manufacturing of his minifigure extended following what they called overwhelming interest. Well, Citizen Brick, which makes custom-printed Lego products, is producing more figures of the Ukrainian president to sell as part of a charity campaign. They've already raised almost £12,500 after selling figures of Mr Zelensky and, would you believe, Molotov cocktails. Well, in a statement, Citizen Brick said they hope to raise £75,000 to support efforts to get medical supplies to refugees. 
Well, next on the Sky News, we will have more from here and the very latest on that breaking news concerning P and O ferries. Hello, this is the Sarah Jane Mee Show with me, Belle Donati. The top story is at two. Breaking news, 800 P&O Ferries staff are made immediately redundant amid a £100 million a year company loss. Searching for survivors, a rescue operation is underway after Russia bombs a theatre where more than 1,000 people were taking cover. Video emerges of the families who were sheltering for safety as the number of casualties is yet to become clear. Meanwhile, Western intelligence suggests President Putin's invasion has largely stalled on all fronts amid reports a fourth Russian general is killed. Reunited at last, the moment they've been waiting for as Nazanin Zaghari Radcliffe and Anusha Azuri arrive home following their Iran ordeal. It's been a long time coming and it's just the most wonderful news to hear 
It's been a lovely 24 hours. Interest rates rise again with a warning from the Bank of England that the cost of living will keep going up. And celebrating St Patrick's Day, massive crowds gather on the streets of Dublin after COVID-19 cancelled large events for two years. Good afternoon. We begin uh, with some breaking news. P&O Ferries has made 800 of its staff redundant, effective immediately, and cancelled all its services for the next few days. The company says it's acted to secure its long-term future. Calls today's decision very difficult but necessary. Union bosses have described the move as scandalous. Uh, well, we have a, a statement from uh, the company and it says, in its current state, P&O Ferries is not a viable business. We've made a £100 million uh, loss year on year, which has been covered by our parent DP World. This is not sustainable. Uh, the statement went on to say, as part of the process we're starting today, we're providing 800 seafarers with immediate severance notices and we'll be compensating them for this lack of advance notice with enhanced compensation packages. Uh, a Department of Transport spokesperson said uh, the Department of Transport is working with the Kent Resilience Forum and all its local partners to ensure the free flow of traffic in Kent. There are other operators running services on cross channel routes so that passengers and goods can continue to travel. Ministers and officials that will be speaking with P&O Ferries later today to understand uh, more about those changes and the impact on staff and passengers. Uh, well, our business uh, presenter, Ian King, is in the city. Let's go straight to him. And Ian, uh, a complete shock uh, for the employees. Uh, what sense is there that this was coming down the pipeline? Well, this is a business that has been struggling for a number of years. It was bought by Dubai-based DP World back in 2019 for £322 million, and it hasn't made a penny profit since. In fact, it's been loss-making ever since DP World acquired it. It lost uh, some £38 million in 2019. In 2020, obviously the year that the pandemic struck, it lost nearly £86 million. The 2021 results have yet to be published, but you read the statement there from p and Ferries in which it's reported, it admitted to a £100 million loss. So that's cumulative losses getting on for £250 million over the last three years. I wouldn't say that all of this business's problems are down to the pandemic, although clearly that has been pretty devastating in terms of what it's meant for passenger travel over the last two years. There have been added complications, I think, by the Northern Ireland protocol. Uh, obviously, that requires customs checks for uh, inbound uh, traffic into Northern Ireland and that has clearly added to uh, complications to the business it owns, apart from, obviously, the well-known Dover to Calais crossing. p and also operates a Cairn Ryan to Larne crossing from Scotland to Northern Ireland across the Irish Sea, also operates from uh, Liverpool to Dublin and from Hull to Rotterdam as well. But I suspect the uh, added complications of the Northern Ireland protocol have probably not helped. And we also know from, recent co from previous company filings that there is a significant liability owed to the merchant Navy uh, Seafarers Pension Fund as well. In the latest uh, accounts to be filed, uh, P&O recognised a liability of some £146 million. And this was, of course, a business that didn't receive any support from the government during the pandemic. Its uh, appeals for support were turned down and DP World, the uh, parent company, actually had to carry on making loans to P&O Ferries to keep it afloat during the pandemic. Uh, those total some £40 million between in the uh, late 2020 and early 2021. It may be possible that there have been subsequent loans made to uh, the company by its parent company since then. We don't know about those. So basically a business that has been struggling for quite some period of time Worth pointing out, as the uh, business points out in that statement, that uh, the move, the actions they're taking today are aimed at making this a sustainable business long term. There have been heavy job losses already in recent years. Shortly after the uh, outset of the pandemic, P&O Ferries made 1,100 employees redundant. That at the time equated to around one in four employees. There have clearly been other job losses since because uh, they're down now as a result of this. Uh, these 800 immediate redundancies today to some 2,200 employees. So this is a much, much smaller business than once it was, and clearly one that has been struggling for a number of years now.
Thank you very much, uh, Ian King, uh, there live in the city. Well, in the last few minutes, uh, P&O Ferries has issued another statement. In it, they've said P&O Ferries has today announced a programme of work to become a more competitive and efficient operator, providing a better service to our customers across the tourism and freight industries. While we enact these changes, there will be significant disruption across P&O Ferries services over the next few days. Uh, however, we are working to minimise the impact on your journey. If travelling on our Dover Calais route, please arrive at the port as booked and we will arrange to get you away on an alternative carrier as quickly as possible.